Good morning, good afternoon, wherever it is you may be listening from, and welcome to episode five of Dugout Talk. My name is Stephen Gossman. And I am Cameron Lingle. And today we've got a little, we've got a more interesting show for you today. Um, one of our early subscribers, his name is Greg Riedel, reached out to me uh, a few days ago with a podcast idea. And because we're early into our, into our running, we want to make our show more directed towards the fans right now. Uh, obviously, we're going to be covering big news stories. Uh, we've got some show ideas starting next week that we're going to run with through the uh, through the rest of the offseason and into spring training, but we want to hear your ideas. So if you have anything that you want to share with us and anything that you want us to take a look at and talk about, please reach out to us on our social media pages um, on Twitter, you, our Twitter handle is at Dugout Talk One. Our Facebook page is Dugout Talk. YouTube channel is Dugout Talk. You can put your requests in the comments on these vi- on these videos. Uh, we want to hear what you guys think. And Greg Riedel reached out to me about this idea with the Seattle Mariners, and we're going to address that today. I'm not going to go into too much detail right now because we want we don't want to spoil too much for you. Um, but let's start off today with a little day in history for baseball. Cam, why don't you go ahead and kick us off with that? Well, nothing, uh, nothing too big. But last season today, or last year today, um, was when uh, the Derek Jeter was Derek Jeter and Larry Walker um, were both officially inducted into the Hall of Fame. Relatively. Very nice. Very nice. That. Wow, it was already a year ago. It's hard to believe. Yeah. So my day in history came in 1929, 92 years ago today. The New York Yankees became the first team in Major League Baseball to put numbers on the backs of their uniforms. Um, they did this by essentially how the batting order went. So the reason Babe Ruth wore number three is because Babe Ruth was the number three hitter. Lou Gehrig wore number four because he was the number four hitter in the lineup. Uh, The Cleveland Indians announced that they would do the same thing a few weeks later. By 1931, all American League teams had numbers on their backs, on the backs of their uniforms. And by 1933, the National League contributed that as well. Uh, So I found that a little interesting today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, But we begin today before we dive in to the Mariners situation. Some very sad news broke just before we got on air. Hall of Fame legend Hank Aaron passed away at the age of 86. Um, And kind of thinking about how 2021 has already gone. It's really, it's just sad. Um, We've lost some really good legends already just in the last two weeks uh, we lost Tommy Lasorda early in the year the longtime Dodgers manager we lost Don Sutton earlier this week and now uh, Hank Aaron has sadly left us um, I'm just I'm looking at his numbers here yeah. and he, considering all the adversity he had to go through with racism in the South because he spent the majority of his career in the Braves yep, yep, organization. Um, you know, they started in Milwaukee and then mm-hmm. they relocated to Atlanta in the sixties. Um, but considering all that adversity he had to go through, even at points receiving death threats during his race to the home run title um, in his, in his career, he was a 25 time all-star from 1954 yeah. to nine. And he played from 1954 to 1976, he, 25 all-star games, 1955 through 1975. So his first and last years in the major leagues were the only times he never mm-hmm. appeared in an all-star game. He was the MVP in 1957, three-time gold glove award, mm-hmm. two-time batting champ, four-time mm-hmm. home run leader and RBI leader. Um, Cam, I don't know. There's, there's not a lot of words to yeah. really describe the feeling of yeah. just. I mean, you get it. He's 86 years old. Is well, he lived mm-hmm. a very good life, but you still just you never expect this. Yeah, I mean, Hammer and Hank. You know, depending on who you ask, he's still the all-time home run leader. Um, 755 home runs. That's hard to do. It still hit 305. A lot of guys nowadays are, are home run or nothing type of guys, but I mean, he's still the, the he's still the all time leader in RBIs, sitting there at 2297. Um, 
you you could you could make the argument that he's one of the two or three best players in baseball history. So to lose lose a guy like that, um, there's not a whole lot you can say other than be grateful um, for all the memories that he could have provided, and uh, and look forward to how players even today are still influenced and inspired by uh, what he went through in his daily life. Yeah, and I'm reading, so I'm reading a little history on Aaron's early career. So he was a Negro League star, and mm-hmm. he there were two teams that offered him major league contracts. One was the New York Giants, and the other was the Boston Braves. And the only reason Aaron said that he didn't become teammates with Willie Mays with the New York Giants was because the Braves offered fifty dollars more. Wow, and can you imagine if Mays and Aaron had ended up being on the same team? Um, the giant, the giants would have been yeah. baseball enemies. Um, the, the giants would have been what the Yankees have become. Like they probably would have went on that run in the fifties and sixties that the Yankees did. But even then Aaron going to the Braves, he was teammates with Eddie Matthews and yes. that duo still holds the record today for the most home runs hit as teammates with 863. Um, so, I mean, either way, either team could have won mm-hmm. on this deal, I believe. And it's just, it's crazy to look at that and say, wow, he $50 more, the Braves just, you know, the Braves just offered that much and he decided yeah. I'm going to go be a Brave. Um, and I think it. It is kind of crazy to think that the team relocated to Atlanta before he debuted Mm -hmm. um, as a Boston Brave. And considering all the racism that had been going on in the South during that time, that was around the same time the civil rights movement was starting to gain Mm -hmm. heat. Um, I can't imagine what it would have been like for Aaron playing in a city like that, going through what it went through um, and playing in a region that went, that was going through, all of those shenanigans of just the awful racism that was taking place in the country. Um, I mean, he came through a lot. I think you look back on his career, the numbers, the numbers are brilliant, but considering all the history that was going on at that time too, it's just as important to look at. Absolutely. So once again, Hank Garen dead at the age of 86. He was about three weeks away from his 87th birthday. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going mi- to, we're going to miss him. You know, I know neither of us got the chance to watch him play, but our grandparents and parents did. Mm-hmm. And I know that they all have stories, whether they followed him deeply or not. They, they all have stories to some degree on just what it was like to watch him. Yeah. The Hank Aaron award. And that's going to have a lot more, a lot more meaning to it going forward. Exactly. Not that it didn't already, but I mean, once you once you once you actually lose the guy that the award is named after, it kind of gains gains a lot more meaning. Yeah, it just feels a little it feels a little more special mm-hmm. now. Um, so anyway, let's let's go ahead and dive in to what our main focus of the episode is today. Um, so the Seattle Mariners. They have been a team of mediocrity, to say the least, in their uh, 44 years of history. They became a franchise in 1977. Uh, Early on through their first 18, 19 years, they failed to reach 500. Um, They were even very close to being forced to relocate Mm -hmm. in 1992 because they weren't getting fan attendance at the kingdom they weren't getting a lot of support just in general um but then the nintendo gaming company bought the team in 1992 and they kept the team in seattle and a few years later in 1995 the team finally made the playoffs um it was a short it was a little bit of a shortened year because of the 1994 strike but they finished first in the AL West with a 79 and 63 record that year. They made it to the ALCS, lost to the Indians in uh, six games. But this was kind of the start of 
a good run of success for six years. Mm-hmm. They had stars like Ken Griffey Jr. Alex Rodriguez was starting to come up through the system. Randy Johnson was leading the pitching staff. Um, Jamie Moyer was coming through around this time as well. And they had a really solid team on paper. And from 1995 to 2001, they made four playoff appearances. Three of those, they made it to the ALCS, but they just felt short, it felt like. Um, and then we go into 2001. Yeah. In 2001 was a year of where did this team come from? Mm-hmm. Um, when you look at the previous few years, in 1998, they sold, they traded Randy Johnson, their ace, to the Houston Astros. He was about to become a free agent, and the Mariners weren't really in the race for the division that year. So they traded him to the Astros, and they weren't able to re-sign him again after that. Um, then after the 1999 season, Ken Griffey Jr., the rookie, the kid, he left. He demanded a trade to be closer to family. They tra- The Mariners traded him to the Cincinnati Reds. And then after the 2000 season, their star shortstop, Alex Rodriguez, became a literal enemy in that city and is still mm-hmm. considered an enemy yeah. in that city by signing a 10-year, $252 million deal with division rival Texas Rangers. Thankfully for Mariners fans, that didn't really work out for the Rangers either. Mm-hmm. But to go to a division rival like that and sign with for that much money felt very criminal in the eyes of the fan base out there. And 20 years later, fans still feel that way about A-Rod. Well, but, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Speaking, speaking of that 95 team, um, if, if you remember um, the, the last game of the ALDS against the Yankees when Edgar hit the walk-off uh, double, it was there was a 20-year-old kid named Alex Rodriguez who was standing in the, uh, in the box. He, he, was, he was next man up. Like, imagine, imagine what his Seattle mystique and his Seattle legend could have been had it been the rookie A-Rod who came up and hit the walk off instead of Edgar Martinez. Imagine what that could have led to. Yeah, you never know. Um, yeah, you just you never know what yep. that what that could have been. And I mean, A Rod still has a legacy, I guess, in oh, yeah. Seattle. He's one of the best. Pro- he's one of the best players to ever come up through their system. Mm-hmm. Um, but he did tarnish it by the move he made to go to Texas. And like I said, it didn't really work out for the Rangers. So um, I guess in a way, karma sucks. Uh, and Mariners fans kind of got their redemption that way. But still, it, it hurts. You never want to see a guy sign mm-hmm. a record contract like that to go to a division rival. Um, kind of thing in modern day with the with uh, Bryce Harper. Yeah. Going to Philly for 13 years and north of $300 million and kind of slapping Nationals fans in the face. But what yep. did Washington do? Two years later, they won a World Series. So, and it kind of brings me into the 2001 team. You know, the Mariners lost Alex Rodriguez to that record contract. And lo and behold, with no real star players on the team, no guys that going into the year on paper were like, oh, this guy is going to carry the team. This guy is the face of the franchise. I mean, they signed Ichiro Suzuki, the... Uh, the prized Japanese mm. baseball player, but they, no uh, one they signed him. him. No so one expected made... him to do what he was, what he did. Like there were, there no, were. I mean, there were no you know, rookie year. There's not. Yeah, there weren't a lot of high expectations for him. But mm-hmm. the team went on to win MLB record 116 games, breaking the record of 114 set by the Yankees in 1998. Um, and the thing is, the Yankees won the World Series that year handedly. Mm-hmm. They swept the Padres with that 114 wins. But 116 wins, and according to baseball reference, they have a Pythagorean win-loss chart. I don't know exactly how they measured that. Len Casper, if you're listening to this or if you find <laughs> this, I would love to hear how you actually figure this out. Um, by the way, he's the one who runs baseball reference. He's the man in charge of that. According to their Pythagorean win-loss record, they were still a 109-win team. Mm. Um, 
based on how many runs they scored and how many runs they allowed, they may have overachieved a little bit, but they still 109 wins is still a lot of wins yeah. for what this team was. Uh, Lou Pinella was still their manager. And by the way, Pinella is the only manager to ever be at the helm for the Mariners in their postseason runs. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also holds the record as the winningest manager in team history with 840 wins. Um their general manager was Pat Gillick, which, by the way, Gillick built the World Series team championship team in Philadelphia in 2008. He built he was the one in charge of that core. Uh, so the Mariners had something going here with 116 wins. They were in the ALCS the year before lost to the Yankees, um, but they had the best record in baseball led on offense by Edgar Martinez. I guess mm-hmm. you could say Edgar was the guy. If there was anyone who was going to carry the team, Edgar was the leader. Um, but some other names they had, they had a rising star in Mike Cameron, who was still young, but making his rounds. They had the rookie Ichiro. They had John Olerud manning first. They had the veteran Dan Wilson behind the plate. Um, David Bell, the current Cincinnati Reds manager, was their third baseman that year. They had Brett Boone, the brother of Aaron Boone. Um and then on the pitching staff, they weren't really all that spectacular. They didn't have any big name guys yeah. on the pitching staff either. I mean, Jamie Moyer was there and he won 20 games that season, but Freddie Garcia was the ace of that team. And Garcia won 18 games that season with a 305 ERA. Um, but really, this team on paper didn't look like they were that good. Yeah. You know, they, they look kind of more. They might, they, they'll probably be in the playoffs. They could be in the playoffs, but after losing a rod, mm-hmm. I don't think anybody really expected them to compete that much. And then they come around and win 116 games and basically break baseball yeah. by accomplishing this. And to look at their pitching staff that year, just to give a kind of perspective of how not big name the rotation was between the six, uh, they had a, regular four-man rotation of Freddie Garcia, Aaron Seeley, Jamie Moyer, and Paula Abbott. And then John Halama and Joel Pinheiro, they kind of split time between the bullpen and the starting rotation that year. Their closer was a guy named Kazuhiro Sasaki, who recorded 45 saves that season. Uh, They also had some younger relievers, like a guy by the name of Brian Fuentes, who is considered one of the best relievers in Colorado Rockies history. They had Norm Charlton and Jeff Nelson, who was on the Yankees 1998 World Series team. Um, But other than that, this team, to win 116 games with what they had, broke baseball. No one expected that from them. But just to kind of put into perspective what happened in the playoffs, they, they beat Cleveland three to two they they got they took care of the indians but they ran into the big bad yankees again for the third time in six years and the yankees just blew them out of the water Mm -hmm. in that alcs that year in five games they blew them out and to be fair the yankees had just won three world series in a row yeah um but the mariners won 116 games still they they should have on paper kicked the butt of the Yankees. They should have, they should have pounded them into the ground, buried them alive. And it, they just didn't for whatever reason. I don't know if they did overachieve sorely that year or not. Um, I think they would have been a legit playoff contender still that year with what they had, but for them to just get blown out of the water, like they did by the Yankees, um, it just kind of makes you wonder what in the world happened to that team. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whether you want to call it overachieving um, for the most part, the team was still really young. The team was still meshing together. Um, and I think it just goes to show how great of a manager they had in Lou Pinella. You know, the guy was able to take all these pieces. Like they went from David to Goliath and then they went from Goliath back to David it was when they re-became David that they won 116 games. You know, they, they never they never came close to winning 116 when they had Randy Johnson, Ken Griffey Jr., and A-Rod all on the team at the same time. 
they never came close to it, but it was only after they got rid of those guys and they were just left with Edgar Martinez, uh, Edgar Martinez, Freddy Garcia, and uh, Ichiro. Like, that was the team that won 116 games. Um, so I, say, I think it says a lot about their manager, Lou Pinella. And, I mean, you can just it just goes to show what happened literally the year after he left. It just kind of fell apart. Yeah, and to put this into perspective, too, after 2001, in 2002, they still – they won 93 games yeah. that year. Yeah, but That was the, his last year. Then the crazy thing is, is they finished third in that division. Mm-hmm. And they, they were a third-place team. The Oakland A's were in Moneyball era at that time. They won 102 games. The Angels won 99, got the wild card, and it eventually won the World Series that mm-hmm. year. Um, but after 2002 – and the 2002 team didn't change much. Uh, really, the only thing they did, they traded David Bell to the Giants and got uh, Desi Relaford in return. And then they acquired Jeff Cerillo, uh from the Milwaukee Brewers as their everyday third baseman. Um, but other than that, the team didn't really change all that much. Although I did notice it looked like in 2002, Jamie Moyer and Freddie Garcia were the two regular starters, but then they kind of split. It looked like they were experimenting with the other traditional three spots on the rotation. Mm -hmm. They used seven different guys throughout the year in the rotation. Now, Joel Pinheiro, he made 28 starts that year. So that's a a fair amount, but he was still in and out of the bullpen. And then James Baldwin made 23 starts that year, 30 games overall. Um, the only other guy they had that actually didn't appear out of the bullpen that wasn't named Jamie Moyer and Freddie Garcia that year was Ismael Valdez. Uh, and he was with the Dodgers for a long time before going to Seattle. Um, but other than that, they, it looked like they kind of were experimenting around using different guys in the rotation throughout the year. They didn't have a consistent starting lineup or starting rotation necessarily outside of Moyer and Garcia, but they still won 93 games. I don't recall ever seeing a team doing something like that. Exactly. Um, go ahead. It's not like you're going to say something. No, no, I was just taking a breath. You're good. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Cool. Um, but again, they won 93 games that year, but this is around the time the Yankees Red Sox rivalry mm-hmm. was really heating up Peaking. and it was, it was at its peak coming in to this time. Now, another note, like you said, this was Lou Pinella's last year managing mm-hmm. the Mariners. He had one more year left on his contract, but he pretty much told the Mariners front office, he didn't want to return for his final year. And so what did the Mariners do? They traded his contract rights to some small market team named the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. Of all the teams that could have, that could have gotten Pinella, it was the Devil Rays. And I get it. He's from the Tampa area, but you look back at that, you know, as Mariners fans are thinking, why would, why would you want to leave? Um, It's still something that doesn't make a ton of sense today. And that's not something you see a lot where coaches will get traded or have their rights traded Mm -hmm. um, to other teams. But Lou Pinella did just that. And after this, we were kind of, I don't know about you, but at least when I was doing research on this team's 20 years of mediocrity and why they haven't made the playoffs, it made me wonder, did Sweet Lou curse the Mariners by requesting this trade? Yeah, it's it's very possible. Um, they've never they've never really had a guy. Now I understand you know Lou Pinella is one of the more prestigious managers um, in baseball history, but they've never really had a guy to come close to his talent. Um, I know that managers only do so much, and they can only do they can only get so much out of the product on the field but they still go a long way towards deciding whether a team ends up being good, ends up being decent or ends up being bad. And like Bob Melvin, Mike Hargrove, um, you know, McClendon, Cerverus now, like they, they haven't really had that guy to, to really take the time, put the years in and turn this team around. 
Yeah, and you know, don't get don't get us wrong. Some of those names we've mentioned, you look at them now, and they have mm-hmm. put up some good resumes, like Bob Melvin, for example. Yeah. Now, yep. to Melvin's credit, the Mariners did win ninety three games again in 03, yeah. but they were two back of the wild card, and you had the Red Sox and the Yankees to deal with, and mm-hmm. the AL East between the Red Sox and the Yankees, neither one of those teams had to win the division. It was, you know, they're going to win 90 games at least. And they're either one's going to make the playoffs unless if something really went wrong for them, which it didn't. Um, We saw in 03 and 04, the Yankees and Red Sox and the ALCS Mm -hmm. Yankees winning in 03 Red Sox winning in 04. So Seattle, the only way, they were going to make the playoffs was if they could take down the Oakland A's and Oakland's money ball era was just, they were just that good. They won 103 mm-hmm. games in 2003. And again, to Bob Melvin's credit, he got them, he still got them to 93 wins. And mm-hmm. I wanted to note this on the O three team because they still had a good offense. Uh, Jeff Surreal really tanked. That wasn't, he was not all that great for them, but they were getting each they were continuing to get consistent production out of each row. Edgar mm-hmm. Martinez was still Edgar Martinez, yeah. even though he was aging, he was 40 years old in O three, but he still hit 294 that year, uh, which is worth noting. And then, of their starting pitching, and I got to I gotta note this because I've never seen anything like this either, but they, all five of their starters, going into opening day, they had Jamie Moyer, Ryan Franklin, Joel Pinheiro, Freddie Garcia, and Gil Mesh. And they were the only five starters they used that year. No one else started a game for that team. None of those guys recorded an ERA under three, but Jamie Moyer had 21 wins that year and a 3.27 ERA. All of their starters won at least 10 games. And of the 93 wins that the team got, their starters recorded 75 of those wins. Mm. You just don't hear that now. No. And that is impressive in and of itself. And to think that they didn't make the playoffs with that kind of talent and just being able to come through like that is mind boggling in and of itself. And it makes you wonder what, like, yeah, I get it. The Red Sox and Yankees were the top teams mm-hmm. in baseball at that time. And for Oakland, I know a lot of people are still thinking with Moneyball, like, yeah, it was a baseball minds. Sure, on paper it looked great, but people still think that that shouldn't have happened. Yeah. The A's should not have been as good as they were. And it's almost criminal because the Mariners seem to be doing things right. And Mm -hmm. a team like Moneyball was coming in and just blowing everybody out of the water. It felt like the only problem was Moneyball couldn't get them past the league division series. Yeah. Yeah. So everything kind of fell apart after that Uh, immediately. It immediately fell apart. I mean, you look at 2004 and they regressed from 93 wins to 63 wins. So imagine, imagine having five guys pitch all your games in 93, and then you look at how they were in 94. Only five of their 15 qualified pitchers, um, five of their 15 pitchers that had at least 10 appearances, only five of them had an ERA under four. Like their, their pitching was super bad, super bad. Um, this was the – this was um, – uh, this would have been Bob Melvin's final season. Uh, they lost some bats. They lost a couple hitters uh, to free agency. Um, I believe it was um, Edgar Martinez's last season. Was that 04 or was that 05? Let's see. What is the stat? It was 04. 04. Yep. 04 so was they, his last year. They lost a couple guys. You look forward to 2005. Um, now they have Mike Hargrove at the helm. And Mike Hargrove wasn't wasn't a bad guy. They had him for a couple years. Uh, the team, I think, had finally realized that their their peak had passed. They were looking to flip stuff around. Um, Felix Felix Hernandez had just debuted in 2005 and actually debuted to a, a fairly good a fairly good um, season. Um, 2005 was not. It wasn't great. You know, they went 63 and 93 or 69 and 93. Um, but you could kind of tell that they were officially done 
uh, with their their peak they just went through at the end of the Lupinella, beginning of the Bob Melbourne era, and the issue is is they never really they never really got out of that rebuilding phase. You know, there were a couple points in time where they tried to they tried to compete, they tried to throw stuff together. Um, you know, fast forward a whole bunch of years when they signed Robinson Cano to a massive deal. Um, they tried, but they never, they just, I don't know. They just couldn't really ever get it together. You know, they just, uh, whether it was a better team in front of them or whether it was bad pitching or bad hitting, you know, they never put it all together. They never had all their, all their pins firing at the same time. Yeah. And I think uh, that was a common theme that you and I both noticed was from Mm -hmm. 2004 to 2013. It was, it always felt like there was one side of their game that was better than the other. There were some years they had really great pitching, but the offense was just awful. There were some years their hitting was good, but their pitching just never figured it out. Um, and you're right. I think when they, when the team hired Mike Hargrove in 2005, Hargrove had a good reputation. He was the Indian skipper when they made the World Series in 95 and 97. Mm-hmm. So he had – that resume and he was also with the Orioles when they had uh there's there some of their successful runs too so mm-hmm. hiring a guy like Mike Hargrove seemed really good but the problem was and I was listening to a, a YouTube video on the Mariners legacy uh urinating tree baseball I think was the one that came out with it and basically Mike Hargrove never really had the clubhouse mm-hmm. uh, he, he was there for two and a half seasons Ichiro went as far as to say, um, you know, he didn't want Hargrove in the dugout. He, he came out in 05 and said this, and it took the Mariners. Well, actually, the Mariners didn't even do anything about it because Hargrove ended up resigning in 2007. Um, which, by the way, in 2007, the Mariners had 88 wins that year, and they were, in, they were at the top of the division when Hargrove just got up and left. He, he was 45 and 33 that year in 78 games. And he, the, he quoted, I don't have passion for the job anymore. Therefore I'm leaving. And if it wasn't Lou Pinella, you got to wonder if it was Mike Hargrove who kind of hurt this team too. Yeah. Because Hargrove like Pinella had a good reputation. He had a good resume and for him to just get up and leave the way he did is like why why did he do that did he really lose passion or like what Ichiro was saying was he really did he never really have the clubhouse even though the Mariners were a legit contender in 2007 it's it's crazy to look both both managers both Hargrove and his replacement McLaren in 07 um, both guys had a winning record it's not often that you see a manager get replaced you know quote-unquote replaced and especially with a winning record, but then to also have his replacement come in and put up a winning record as well. Um, they had, they had a good offense at that point. They had Kenji Johima behind the plate. Uh, they had Richie Sexton at first base. They had Adrian Beltre who they just signed um, at third base. They had a who's about as, about as late of a bloomer as you could ever have. I don't think he really did anything until after he had turned 30 and Abanez um, was in his second tenure with the team yeah. at this time. Yep. And then you also had Ichiro, who was still doing his thing. And even even um, Ozzy Guillen was playing pretty well for them. They they had a good offense. But speaking of 2007, um, a guy that I just had to point out, Horatio Ramirez, who made 20 starts for the team in 2007. 20 starts. He had an ERA of 7.16. He went 8-7. and seven. <laughs> in 20 starts and for 20 games like I can't stress this enough 20 times they sent this man to the mound to win a game and how he ended with a winning record I'm not sure it had to have been attributed to that offense but a seven yeah, it, six ERA it had to have been I mean and looking at how that offense was the Mariners hit 287 as a team that year they yeah. were second in the AL yep. um so on paper and you kind of you look at what this team did and actually according to the Pythagorean win loss theory the Mariners won 
nine more games than they should have that year too. Wow. Uh, they still allowed more runs than they scored and they won 88 games. So it was like an up and down year for them. They either the offense was there for them yeah. uh, at times or the pitching was there and the offense was not. Um, and a note on John McLaren um, for having to, if we're the situation Mike Hargrove put him in, he still finished, he still had a 43 and 41 record that year in that in that little half stretch of games that he managed Mm -hmm. um which like you said that's not easy for both guys to still keep a team above 500 um although i will say mclaren probably wasn't the man for the job because in 2008 the team went from nearly being a playoff contender to they were 61 and 101 and they that's when more mediocrity hit them and Jim Riggleman mm-hmm. took over midway yeah. through the season as the manager. They also did a front office shift. They fired uh, Bill Bavese in June. I think it was the same time McLaren was released from his job as well. Um, but then, and also it's important to look too because the Mariners, even in their glory years in the early two thousands, they not only were the Red Sox and Yankees, the team, the two teams that were guaranteed playoff spots, but the AL West, you had the Oakland A's and Moneyball, and then the Angels came through from 2004 to 2009 and absolutely dominated the West. Uh, minus 2006, Oakland won the division in 06, but mm-hmm. um, you know the Angels were the team to beat in that division, and they were so stupid good that the Mariners didn't really stand a chance being Mm -hmm. kind of in like the rebuild mode, but uh, for a couple of years, they put up some good seasons, like good enough seasons to stay competitive and kind of keep the West on edge. But at the end of the day from 04 to 09, the angels owned that division. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and this brings me into 2009 because they finished with 85 wins under Don Wakamatsu and Mm -hmm. They finished third in the division, but this is also around 2009. This was the last year of the Angels glory days and the Texas Rangers who didn't know the the Rangers had no idea what success was Mm -hmm. really coming into before 2010. I mean, they had a couple of good years, but nothing consistent. And now the Texas Rangers are on rise because they've got guys like Nelson Cruz, Ian Kinsler, Derek Holland, Matt Harrison, and Coley Lewis in the rotation. And Texas is building a legit contender. And so Seattle, they, yeah, they had 85 wins in 09, but then they went right back to mediocrity mm-hmm. from 2010 to 2013. And um, it was like, you know, they had, they had to literally tear everything down after 2010 they they were pretty much forced to at that point they didn't completely do it before and now 2010 comes around they have another 61 and 101 season and they have to tear down at this point Mm -hmm. yeah they they almost put it together in 2009 um their pitching showed a little bit of promise they had king felix who was just entering his prime 2009 is what i would consider like the first year of his elite status um eight straight years of 200 innings but they had him they had eric Bittard, they had jared washburn and they had uh roland smith and they had david ardsma out of the bullpen their offense was kind of kind of getting up there in age um but it was still productive the pitching was starting to show promise and not only that but it 2010 was looking really really hopeful for uh for seattle fans because that that was they i believe they got um cliff lee in december yeah, of 2009 and they traded him in july of 2010 i believe it was july 9th and they traded him for essentially three nobodies and justin smoke mm-hmm. and so he was he was he was pretty good for seattle too but i mean you look at a guy like cliff lee and he and for the first four months of the season, you had Cliff Lee, King Felix, Jason Vargas, and Doug Fister. Like that was a good one through four rotation. You could throw just about anybody in the number five spot and you were probably set for at least the next three to four years, but immediately fell apart, traded Cliff Lee, 
bad return again, another trade where they came out as the utter loser, the complete and utter loser of that trade. Um, Justin Smoke put up a couple years um, of relatively productive um, statistics for them, but I mean, you go and you go and get a guy like Cliff Lee and then you immediately trade him is crazy. And a couple years before, and you know, looking at some of the young prospects they had in their system, mm-hmm. Adam Jones is one yeah. that comes to mind because they traded him for Eric Bedard. Yeah. And Bedard never had a healthy season in Seattle. No. Um, they also had Michael Morse mm-hmm. and Morse was traded before he could prove himself. They also had a guy named Shinsu Chu, yeah. who he could have been a huge blessing for them, but Absolutely. they traded him to the Indians and he tore yeah. it up in Cleveland and he still continues to tear it up. Sure. He's, still, he's, yep. he's regressed, but he's, he's a smart hitter. Um, and to think what the Mariners could have had in Adam Jones, Shinsu yeah. Chu, Michael Morse, um, and a note on Cliff Lee in 2010, 234 ERA and three record yeah. that year. And it's just a shame that it didn't work out for them, um, which brings us into the rebuild years because from 2010 to 2013, they had to tear down and start over. They brought Eric Wedge in to lead the club. And Wedge kind of had a personality in a way like Pinella, not as angry of a guy, but he had a, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of Eric Wedge, but he looks like he's been in a few bar fights in his day. Um, That really, what was that facial hair mustache type that he had that like curled down to past his lips, but then kind of went off to the side. Like he just looked like a mean dude out there, but Wedge just never could get the job done out there. And I get it. Seattle was in their rebuild stages. They had top prospects of Justin Smoke and Dustin Ackley coming up. Um, they had Carlos Piguero coming in, Franklin Gutierrez, yep. um, Greg Hallman, who mm-hmm. was one of their top prospects at the time, Mike Carp, Kyle Seeger was coming through the system, yep. as was Michael Saunders. Um, and a guy and, they'd just gotten from the Yankees, um, Jesus Montero, he was, and he was Jesus, supposed to be. And Jesus Montero turned out to be one of the biggest busts yeah. in baseball history. Yep. Um, so... Yeah, from there, those three years were awful. But then 2014 comes around Mm -hmm. and things, I know they only finished with 71 wins in 2013. They had another last place finish, but Mike Zanino, who they had drafted number three overall in 2010, I believe, was coming up. He debuted a little, he played 52 games in 2013, but 2014 he was uh, he was here officially he yeah. arrived um they had michael saunders still they had kendry's morales although um uh, morales didn't return to the team until later in the season um but they had they had a little more promise and the team felt like under new management or i'm sorry not necessarily under new management but with eric wedge out they brought in a guy named lloyd mcclendon and mcclendon was a go-getter um, to me, I still think the Mariners did him a little dirty by letting him go after two years. Uh, cause to me, McClendon is a lot better of a manager than what they kind of, than what they did to him. He didn't deserve to be fired after 2015, yeah. I still think, but 2014 comes around and there is some hype around the team. As you mentioned, Robinson Cano, he leaves, he leaves the big city of New yep. York, of New York. He signs a 10 year deal with the Mariners Kyle Seeger is coming up in his prime. Mm-hmm. You know, they've got Michael Saunders and Dustin Ackley. They also brought in Logan Morrison. He had some mediocre years in Miami, but they brought him in to bolster the offense. Uh, they still have Justin Smoke, Austin Jackson. They bring him in later in the year from Detroit. I mean, this team is looking better on paper. They have Felix Hernandez still at the top of the rotation, which he was the Cy Young Award winner that year. Mm -hmm. Um, But behind him, they had Hisashi Wakuma, Chris Young, Erasmo Ramirez, rookie James Paxton is coming into the picture, and uh, Ryan Asilias. And they also had Fernando Rodney is the closer's role. So, and Taiwan Walker is also making his way up uh, through the team at this point too. So, and, and things started looking up for them. They finally posted a winning season. 
87 and 75. It was their best record since 2007 when they won 88 games. And this was the closest the Mariners had ever been to the playoffs since 2001. They were, and also another note in 2012, the second wild card was added mm-hmm. uh, to both leagues. So it, it, realistically, it should have made things a little easier yeah. for the Mariners to get in. But in 2014, the A's were still really good. They they pretty much ruled the West from 2012 to 2014. Mm-hmm. But the Angels came out of nowhere and won 98 games yeah. and got the top seed. And then the Royals, uh, who were yep. terrible for 29 years, they snapped their playoff drought. And Seattle kind of got left in the dust there because they had a good enough team to make the playoffs. And on the final day of the year, they lost out because Oakland – and Kansas City both won yep. on the final day of the season. Yeah, it was, you know, and in 2014 was essentially really their last chance with Felix because that was the end of his, that was the end of his peak years. Um, he was never the same after that. Routinely had ERAs well north of four, um, almost exclusively north of four um, after that 2014 season. That was really their best chance at, at, at trying to make one last run for it. And like, like the, like the past, what, 15 years have shown, there's just always a better team in front of them. And looking, looking ahead after 2014, even if the Mariners had stayed competitive, the Rangers had their resurgence in 15 and 16. Um, and it was the Astros essentially after that 15 through 19, they essentially ran that division. And then you had Oakland come back in 2018, 19 and 20 who have put up great years. Like they, one of the most unlucky organizations um, as, as definitely in the two thousands and 2010s, but potentially ever, like I've never seen a team that gets consistently beaten out so so it's they've always come so close when they when they have a competing team they always get so close but it just feels so far away with how they uh how unlucky they seem to be especially since 2014 because considering Mm -hmm. in 2014 they were one game out in 2016 they were three games out Mm -hmm. they won 86 games their first year under scott surveys um and in 2018 they won 89 games which that's the most games they've won since 2003 in a regular mm-hmm. season and they still fell short because Oakland and Houston have been running the West essentially since that time. And even with the two wild cards, you've got to put the Yankees in there because the Yankees have had a resurgence since 2017. Mm-hmm. And that was also when Boston was really good. And now, unfortunately for the Mariners, the Tampa Bay Rays the last two years have made noise and yeah. looking even ahead to this year, Obviously, you know, the Mariners have been really mediocre again the last couple of seasons, but I think they have a bright future in uh, Kyle Lewis, yeah. who looks to be their guy going into going into the immediate future. Yeah. Um, and just to look kind of deeper at 2020, I know they do have – Jared Kolarik is another guy that they're really mm-hmm. high on. Um, he's one of their top prospects right now. Evan White is another guy yep. that they've got. Looking at the 2020 roster, at least for opening day, you know, they had a rookie in Evan White. They got a rookie in Shed Long. They got a young player in J.P. Crawford. Jose Marmaleos is another guy that they're over there that's young. They got Ty France from the Padres. Dylan Moore's there, too. Mm-hmm. Um they've got a young team again going into 2021 and it's really hard to picture that they're going to be competitive this year. Um, which would mean a 21 year playoff drought for the team. If you know, things don't necessarily go well for them. And I think looking at the starting rotation, they got a guy named Marco Gonzalez right now who seems to be their ACE and they got Yusei Kikuchi, Justice Mm -hmm. Sheffield, uh, Justin Dunn's another guy that they've got. Yep. So they have, I think they have the pieces where in the near future, they could be back to competing again, but looking at other teams in the American league in the ALS, yeah. especially Oakland is probably still going to run the table at least this year. 
and the angels are knocking on the door too, which makes me think that Anaheim is probably going to be back to their winning ways again. Um, as far as Houston goes, I'm not exactly sure about Houston, but in the rest of the league, now in the, in the central, you got the twins and the white Sox yeah. who are going to be competing in the East. You got the blue Jays who are rising as yeah. well as the Yankees. Yeah. And eventually you got to figure the Royals and Tigers are going to be in too. Yeah. And it feels like the same narrative is being written for Seattle. They, they are trying to put the team together and it's yep. not like they've been a terrible team in the last 20 years. Cause they've had some good years. Yeah. They've had some bad years, but they have had some decent years too. So it's not like they've been a terrible franchise. It's literally, they're just running in to some of the worst luck you could possibly run into. And eventually it's like, all right, who cursed the team? Yeah. Because you look at the Cubs and the Billy, the goat, uh, curse from 1945. You look at the Red Sox and Hank, the uh, Babe Ruth curse from 1918. Yep. Uh, the White Sox and the Black Sox scandal curse. Mm-hmm. You know, it took these teams years to finally break those curses, um, quote unquote. And the Mariners, you just got to wonder who cursed this team. And yeah. that's why looking at it and seeing what Lou Pinella did after the 2002 season, considering he was the winningest manager in team history. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder, did Lou Pinella's curse, did sweet Lou curse the Mariners? Is he the reason why this team has been up and down and just has had the worst luck for the last 20 years? Um, Or is it, is it Mike Hargrove? Did Hargrove add onto that curse with just abruptly leaving the team while they were still in a successful run? Um, I mean, could it, could it even, could it even be like the Ken Griffey Jr. curse? You know, he left and he left after the 99 season and like he, it wasn't, it wasn't good how he left. You know, he really was just, he was just tired of the Seattle area. He was tired of the Seattle ownership. He was tired of the Seattle management. Um, could it have been could it have been a mix of all three maybe you know or could it or could did uh a rod's curse yeah a rod leaving the team and and then you gotta wonder did seattle actually break baseball by winning 116 games yeah and nobody yeah. expected them to did they were they so successful in one year that <laughs> the baseball gods said for the yeah. next 30 you have to come back to earth um i don't know if we i think and I'm surprised that a lot of people haven't been talking about this is mm-hmm. like, why, like what is wrong with them? Um, and I think historically just in the last 20 years, yeah, they've run into some awful luck within the division and then just within the American league with other teams yeah. being able to build up success so quickly. Um, so Mariners fans, hopefully you won't have to endure this much longer, but um give us your thoughts. If you're listening to this, give us your thoughts. Like, what do you think is the reason why the team has been in limbo for this long? Um, we, we want to hear your thoughts too, because this is really just kind of interesting looking over how the team has been over the last two decades and seeing where realistically at times they should have been a playoff team and then coming to see that they're not. And mm-hmm. who knows, maybe if Commissioner Manfred is actually approved, or if Commissioner Manfred has the league expand to eight playoff teams yeah. in each league, maybe that's what it takes for Seattle to get there finally. But who knows? We thought, I mean, even with five teams being in the playoffs, they've had a couple of years they should have been mm-hmm. that second wild card on paper. Um, but who knows? Maybe, maybe you, maybe for Mariner, for the sake of Mariners fans, we need to have one year where when they are 20, if they are 15 games over 500, Commissioner Manfred comes out in September yep. and says, listen, we want Seattle to be in the playoffs. We need eight teams in the postseason. I don't know. I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but maybe that's what it takes. Maybe Commissioner Manfred just needs to come out and say, so let's Seattle snaps their playoff drought we need to get, we're going to expand the postseason, so then we can guarantee they're going to be in the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If I can just give a message to my Mariner fans out there, even, even as, you know, a fan of the big, bad Yankees, I always root for you guys always do. And with the, with the core that you guys are putting together in Seattle right now, 
it the future looks bright kyle lewis looks like he's going to be a stud i called it when he got drafted in 2016 you know he body comparison to adam jones and i'm like that would be that would be perfect even if you just get an adam jones type of career out of him he's going to be an important player i think marco gonzalez is a good starter i think justice sheffield has the potential to be a great starter and you guys you guys have something working you guys have something working out there out there on the west coast and uh it might rain all the time, but one of those days that rain's gonna rain's gonna pass, and you guys are gonna win yourselves a ring, and it's gonna be a great day. It's gonna happen. We if the Royals did it, you guys you guys will get there yeah. too, and yeah, hopefully sooner rather than later. Hopefully it doesn't take twenty nine years for you guys to get there. But um, you know, as baseball fans, we feel for, we feel for you guys because this is just one of those things where you want to have hope but it's really hard to have hope when you just fall this short so many times. Um, but I will say this Mariners fans are very loyal. Um, oh, yeah. They consistently show up for their team, no matter how, how good or bad they may be. Um, I, I love, I love the Mariners fan base. I've met, mm-hmm. I've met some of these guys as I've gone to ball games and um, over the years, I think you guys are a very great fan base and, I hope that things do turn around for all of you soon. Um, God, I'm making it sound like this is a, a eulogy almost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at how the last 20 years have gone, it might almost be. <laughs> well, we thank you for listening to us today. We wanted to try something a little different with uh, just kind of exploring what has gone on with the Mariners over the last 20 years. And we hope that you enjoyed this. And again, we want to hear your thoughts on this. Um, Reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube channel. Uh, Give us ideas. What do you want to see in a pod in a future podcast starting next week? We're going to, as spring training starts to approach, um, we are going to be doing breakdowns of every team leading Mm -hmm. up to the season Um, we're going to start with the american league east next week we'll cover a team each day monday through friday and kind of give our and we'll give our predictions at the end of the week Mm -hmm. on what we think the division is going to look like um so if you want to give a if you're a fan of a team and you want to give us information that would be helpful for us because we don't know everything about a team Uh, as much as we try to follow what's going on we're not perfect and if you have information that would be helpful for us please reach out to us and share it with us we'd love to hear your guys' thoughts your guys's um ideas on like who to look out for um what there is to look forward to going into 2021 yeah yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I mean, it's um it's great just sitting down, talking some baseball, um especially especially predictions. I feel like baseball does more. I feel like baseball fans do more predicting than fans of any other sport ever. I have to agree with that. Uh real quick before we get off, the conference championship games in the NFL are going on this weekend, Cam. Mm-hmm. Uh who do you, who do you got? Who who do you think is going to win this weekend? Well, as much as I'd love to say the Bills are gonna pull something off, um, I'm a Steelers fan, so I'll, I'll you know, so no, I'm not going there. But uh, I, I think I think it's pretty hard to beat the Chiefs. I think if there's any team that's going to do it, it's gonna be Buffalo. But it, it all depends on whether or not uh, Patrick Mahomes is gonna be out of the concussion protocol in time. Um, if he isn't then I think it's, I think there's a pretty good chance. I think there's a a great chance that Buffalo pulls one out, but if he's able to go even at 50 to 75%, I I think you have to give it to the chiefs. Um, As far as the NFC goes, as much as I'd love to say the Packers, um, it is Tom Brady. Mm. You saw, you saw what happened to him in the regular season, losing to the saints twice, both relatively bad losses to the saints. Um, and he just he came out and made them look foolish uh, just like that so um, if Patrick Mahomes plays I'm gonna go Chiefs and Packers um, if he doesn't play I'm gonna go Bills Packers but I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure he's gonna play it's yeah. the AFC championship game he's gonna play I'm gonna go Chiefs and Packers 
I will I will second you there. I think with Kansas City playing at Arrowhead, I got the, I, I like the Chiefs' chances at home. Uh, Green Bay playing at home. Believe it or not, this is Aaron Rodgers' first NFC yeah. title game at Green Bay. So I think the Green Bay is just the better rounded team. I'm going to say Packers Chiefs as well. Um, with that said, enjoy the football games this weekend. It's the final weekend before the Super Bowl. So have a great weekend, everyone. We'll be back with you on Monday when we start our 30 for our 30 teams breakdown in the American League East. With that said, I'm Stephen Gossman. I am Cameron Lingle. And so long, and we'll see you next time. Later, guys.